Well, let's look in Nehemiah chapter 9 as we continue our study through Nehemiah. My text is going to be from verse 4 down to verse 15. And I've entitled this study, True Praise to God. What is true praise to God? We have an example here. Remember, we've been looking at how the Lord has blessed his word, the reading of it, the power of his word, and turning the hearts of this people that had been brought back from captivity. And Ezra using this as an opportunity to teach and instruct from the law. And they weren't just teaching a legalism, a message of do's and don'ts, but rather the significance of the law, which is what? Christ. How all of those sacrifices pertain to the Lord Jesus Christ. We already saw that where Peter said that the spirit of Christ that was in them did testify beforehand of the sufferings that he should suffer and the glory that should follow concerning these sacrifices and their significance and what the priesthood represented all as types and pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ the Lord did his work and we saw last time brought the people that he gave a hearing to brought them low and were confessing their sins it says there in verse 2 and iniquities of their fathers in other words, acknowledging that God is just in his judgments. And through that, we saw in verse 3, that they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord God. One fourth part of the day and another fourth part, they confessed and worshipped, worshipped the Lord their God. So this is the setting now as we read here in verses 4 through 15 of what all of this produced how do we know when god is blessing his word well there's going to be true praise of god the attention and focus is not going to be on men or on others around us but on the lord himself here in verse 4 it says then stood up upon the, the stairs this was set up and elevated so a great multitude could see these Levites that were representatives of the Lord before the people. Jeshua and Bani, Kadmiel, Shabaniah, Buni, Sherebiah, Bani, and Chenanai. They cried with a loud voice unto the Lord their God. These were, in every sense of the word, true worship leaders before the people. I know that is a popular title today in religious organizations where they have some that are given the task of being a worship leader. In fact, if you go out and search this, you'll find actual job descriptions of different congregations that are looking for worship leaders. I actually went out there and looked to see what they were looking for when they used that term. I found one congregation in Houston, and you could cookie cut this all the way through, but somebody to teach and sing with and or lead songs with choirs, ensembles, as requested. Independently manage praise team rehearsals manage all administrative duties related to the praise team even down to scheduling attire special attire that was to be worn and then meet with the director of worship arts worship arts ministry leaders music leadership etc and meet with a planning and executive committee in order to have excellent presentations that's an amazing thing but that's not what this is. Nothing about this is orchestrated or designed to be a performance or production to somehow please the people. No, this was a work of the Spirit of God in these representatives before the Lord. 
that together, in verse 4, it says, they cried with a loud voice. Unto whom? Unto the Lord their God. I know this is one of the most difficult things with regard to public worship. And I face it every time I have to stand up here and lead our congregation in worship is that the eyes not be on me, that it not be drawing any attention to myself, but that the Lord be exalted in every way. That's what true praise and worship is. And how different then is the description of these who were leading this congregation in true praise and worship and what people call contemporary worship today. In verse 5, then the Levites, Yeshua, and Cadmiel, Bani, Hajabniah, Sherebiah, Hodijah, Shebaniah, and Pethahiah said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever, and blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. At some point, such was their confession of sin and their acknowledgement of their sinfulness that they fell down before the face of the Lord. Because in verse 2, we find them standing and confessing their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord, their God, one fourth part of the day and another part they confessed and worshiped the Lord, their God. But some point between that and what we're reading here in verse four, where the instruction is given to stand up again, that means then that they had been bowed down in worship. What's significant here isn't necessarily the bodily position. You can have that kind of exercise where you two people to stand up and sit down and go through all of those. That's not worship. It's in the heart. But such was the manner in which the Lord had brought them low that they were bowed before the Lord here. And now the instruction is given to stand up and bless the Lord your God. So that's the first thing I'd have to say here about what true praise is. It's when a people are led in humble repentance and confession of their sinfulness before God. That when they are made to see the forgiveness of God in what those sacrifices represent, because these were the priests. These are the ones who offered the sacrifices. There were sacrifices being offered as all of this was going on. And that the only true hope that any would have would be in God's forgiveness of their sin through those sacrifices. It wasn't just in the confessing of sin, but it is the confession of sinfulness unto God and the looking to Christ alone as being all of their hope. That reason then for them to stand up and bless the Lord. Notice, your God forever and ever. When you look over in First John, the first epistle of John, there's a picture here of what true confession is before the Lord and why that we can praise God whenever he shows us the sinfulness of our sin. Notice in verse 7 of 1 John 1, it says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light. So there it's a matter of walking in Christ, the light. When Christ is revealed in the heart, that light shines in the heart. Not to show us any goodness in us, but the sinfulness of our sin. And as we walk in him who is the light, it says we have fellowship one with another. Imagine here the great fellowship of these as they were made cognizant of God's forgiveness in spite of their sinfulness. The fellowship, but it says here, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 
you can't truly praise the Lord without the revelation of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in the heart. His blood shed there at Calvary, and so complete was that work that there and then, once for all, God imputed his righteousness to the account of those for whom Christ paid the debt. It says in verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. I know a lot of people think that confession of sin is something you do to try to apply the spiritual soap, so-called, to cleanse yourself. You, you, can't, you can't cleanse yourself. That's not where cleansing comes. And to think that somehow by going through that motion that now you have no sin, you deceive yourself. And what? The truth is not in us. If that's your reasoning, who's the truth? It's Christ. But if we confess our sins, that word if can be translated when we confess our sins, when we are confessing our sins, it's a present tense. And the word confession there literally means to say the same thing about our sin as God. In ourselves, there's nothing righteous, no, not one. Therefore, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. A lot of people read that he's faithful and just to us. No, he's faithful and just to his son and to that people that he gave his son to represent and to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, that blood shed. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He's faithful and just in what he promised. That's why I say it's impossible to say that Christ died for every single person in the world because if God punished his son and then turns around and punishes one for whom Christ died, he would be, that'd be double jeopardy. He would be unjust in doing so. But here he's faithful and just to his son to forgive the sins of those for whom he paid the debt. Don't, don't pull it out of its context back here in verse 7. What is it that cleanses us from all sin? It's not our confessing it. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. Everyone for whom Christ paid the debt, he's going to have. That's the connection between the death of Christ and forgiveness of sins. We don't learn about it until it pleases God by his spirit to reveal in us that we were one of those for whom Christ paid the debt. But it wasn't for everybody. And notice there, and to cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. Isaiah said, even our righteousnesses are unrighteousness before him. But the cleansing comes from God's faithfulness to his son to forgive us for Christ's sake. But if we say that we have not sinned, like a lot of people do, they shrug their shoulder and say, well, not bad as the other guy. Well, you're condemned to that. We make him a liar. And his word is not in us. So I believe that's the first thing that we see here with regard to the true worship of God. What it is to truly worship him, to truly praise him, true praise of God. It's the effect of God having been merciful and gracious. And here are these different ones that they mention, Yeshua and some of those names that are a little difficult to pronounce. In fact, if they heard me pronouncing some of these, they'd probably say, who? These all have a different way in the, in the uh, Hebrew. But it's mentioning those Levites that were appointed as leaders through whom the people now would uh, be drawn unto the Lord through this humble confession. It's a picture representation of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, therefore they stood on the stairs and the Levites cried out with a loud voice. That was that it might be proclaimed throughout the whole congregation that was assembled. They didn't have loudspeakers back then or microphones, so they cried out with a loud voice so that they could be heard. That's really a picture of what proclaiming the gospel is it's a proclamation it's not a discussion group it's not people sitting down and determining you know everybody getting a, their say in it who's doing the speaking here but these levites that 
were appointed as representatives of the people. I'm not up here preaching because I think I'm the only one that can or should. And I've often said that, that I don't have to preach. If I can find somebody to preach for me and point me to Christ, I'll sit right down there and listen because I know I need it. But if I do preach, I've got to preach Christ. And I've got to point us as needy sinners to him. And I believe that's the work of the uh, representative of the Lord before his people. And so we see here as we continue on down through this chapter, the substance of, of what this praise is. And I've noted three particular qualities or characteristics of this praise. First of all, in verses five and six, when we talk about praising the Lord, we're talking about praising him as the sovereign God over all creation. Notice here when they said, stand up in verse five and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. And, be, and blessed be thy name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Thou, even thou art what Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein. And thou what preservest them all and the host of heaven worshipeth thee. I had somebody ask me that one time. Well, do you have to believe God sovereign in order to believe God? You can't even say the word God without saying sovereign ruler because the word God means chief magistrate in the beginning God the chief magistrate and that's where all praise begins in giving God all the glory there's not part glory to God and part to man we're all his creatures he's the one that made as it says there in verse 6 heaven and earth the heaven of heavens with all their hosts it's, they're still discovering galaxies out there that no one even knew that existed the heaven of heavens and the lord has made them all and and not only that but the host of heaven it says there worshipeth thee who's that well that's those are the ones that observe all and day they're around the throne crying holy 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 is the lord god almighty but look at that word in verse 6 there at the beginning. Thou, even thou art Lord, what? Alone. I had somebody tell me that. If you just quit saying alone, well, go take your concords and look it up. There's an exclusive way of worshiping God. And it's that which gives him all the glory alone. It's the, it's the exclusive exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. That is salvation, the salvation of sinners. Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. That word, capital L-O-R-D, that's why I like this authorized version here, because that's the word Jehovah, Jehovah God. Wherever you see that, capital L-O-R-D, that's, that's the self-existent one, the great I am, the one who said to Moses when he, he said, well, if, if they ask me who, who has sent me, tell them I am has sent you. And you can note it down wherever you see that in the Old Testament. That's referring to Christ. He's the great I am. That's why he used that specifically when he came to earth. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Just study that. That's all. God has never revealed himself to any but through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what true praise is, is to bless God and his, not just his name, but you notice the, the words that are add, added to it in verse five, it says, blessed be what thy glorious name, where's the glory of God revealed, but in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the first element of praise. It's, it's praise to the sovereign God of all creation. That's the foundation. I know that's when the Lord first began to teach me, open my heart to 
know and understand who he is as God. And uh, I'd read the Bible for years, but I'd always been taught that salvation was a cooperation between God and me. God had laid it all out on the table, but then I've got to, I've got to be the one to serve it up. No, nope. it's from him. It's in him from beginning to end. Then the second element here in verses 7 through 8, to praise God is not only to praise him as sovereign, but to praise him who is faithful to his covenant of grace. You realize salvation is by a covenant? God covenanted from eternity with his son. If we are saved, it's because he named us as beneficiaries in that covenant. That's what the word testament means. Here in our Bibles, we've got the Old Testament and the New Testament. But they both proclaim a God who is faithful to his covenant. In the Old Testament, we see it in types and pictures and prophecy. In the New Testament, we see it fulfilled in Christ. But the only way that any of us have any hope of salvation is in that God purposed through the covenant with his son to name us as beneficiaries. We all have wills where we name those beneficiaries in that will. I didn't go down the street to consult my neighbors and say, well, who do you think I ought to put in the will? <laughs> they say, that's yours. It's your will. You put whoever's name in there, you determine. Well, if that's so with men, why not so even more so with God himself? And notice here in these scriptures, that's how he's being glorified in verse 7. Thou art the Lord, the God who what? Didst choose Abraham. Who does the choosing? God does. Abraham didn't choose God. He was flat on his face in front of idols. He was a Syrian. He wasn't even a Jew when God chose, uh, called him. But it says, who didst choose Abraham and brought us him forth out of the Ur of the Chaldees. It's interesting that that's that same nation that years later the Lord raised up to bring against Jerusalem and to destroy it. And yet it was from that nation, the Ur of Chaldees, that God raised up and chose out Abraham. And gave us to him the name of Abraham. Notice the change from Abram to Abraham. Abram meaning father. Abraham, father of all. All of his seed, but not a physical seed. And to the seed, Paul said there to the Galatians, not to seeds as if there were many, but one seed, which is Christ. And found us his heart faithful before thee, and made us a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Jebusites, and the Girgashites, to give it. How does any possess anything? It's God giving it. I say to his seed, and what has performed thy words, for thou art righteous. Here throughout all their history, even in spite of all of their wanderings, and their being carried away into captivity and brought back again, they go back to, and this is the subject of their praise to God, his faithfulness to his covenant. Abraham here being a picture of Christ, the father of that seed that the father gave him. And... As we praise God, again, just like it begins with him as sovereign God, it's founded upon that covenant that he's purposed and made with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, else we would not exist at all as a people. All the glory belongs unto him. And then we see here in the third part in uh, verses 9 through 15, True praise is to praise God as sovereign over all. Secondly, it's to praise him who is faithful to his covenant that he's made with sinners in Christ. But thirdly, in verses 9 through 15, the praise belongs unto God who actually delivers. It's not that he would like to save or purposes to deliver, but alas, some fall through the cracks. No. Notice here it says in verses 9 through 15. That's what this praise is about. And did see the affliction of our fathers in Egypt. And what heard us their cry by the Red Sea. Why did he hear their cry? Because he purposed to deliver them. And showed us signs and wonders upon Pharaoh and on all his servants. And on all the people of his land. For thou what? Knewest that they dealt proudly against them. 
So didst thou get thee a name as it is this day. <laughs> Salvation belongs unto the Lord. He gets himself the name. There's no exalting a man. And thou didst divide the sea before them. So that they went through the midst of the sea on the dry side. And their persecutors thou threwest into the deeps as a stone into, my, into the mighty waters. There is no case too hard for God. You remember as they, he brought them out with a high hand after having slain the Passover lamb. But there they were with the Red Sea before them and the mountains on either side and the, the Egyptian army bearing down on them. And they cried out. What did Moses say? Stand still and see what the deliverance of the Lord. Who did the delivering? It was the Lord. How did he do it? Through the mediator, Moses. When he smote that water with his rod, that rod representing his authority, the waters parted. I'll tell you, the waters parted when Christ came and paid the sin debt for his people. That's how any that he saved had gone through on dry land. It's in Christ, the mediator. Moreover, thou ledest to them. What you see in all of this is who's doing the acting. Who's doing the leading? Who's doing the delivering? It's God. You can't give him too much glory. You can accuse me of a lot of things in my lifetime when I come to the end, but one thing you cannot is that I gave God too much glory. In fact, I weep over the fact that even after preaching a message like this, I fall so far short of that glory that belongs unto the Lord himself. But he's going to get the glory. Thou ledest them in the day by a cloudy pillar. These are all types and metaphors of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the night by a pillar of fire to give them light in the way wherein they should go. Wasn't the Lord delivering them and saying, okay, you're on your own. Patting them on their rear end saying, make it if you can to the promised land. No, he's the one that directed them all the way. And that's the way it is in salvation. See, this is what it is to give God all the praise and the glory. He actually delivers. He actually saves. He actually preserves and brings every one of his own all the way into glory. Because that's where Christ is seated now, having finished the work. Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai and spakest with them from heaven. That's an amazing thing. Who does God reveal himself but unto that people with whom he's made that covenant? From heaven, who's in heaven? That's his son. And gave us them right judgments and true laws, good statutes and commandments. And again, now looking back, we see that every one of those was a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And made us known unto them thy holy Sabbath. That word Sabbath means rest. Well, what did that Sabbath represent? Christ, the rest that's in him. And command us them precepts, statutes, and laws. But notice, by the hand of Moses, thy servant. All this was given through the mediator, a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. How is it that any of us can approach unto God except it be through that mediator? And what gave this them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought us forth water them out of the rock for their thirst and promised us them that they should go in to possess the land which thou hadst sworn to give them. Who was it that caused them to enter in? It was none other than God himself, according to his promise. And that's our hope of entering in today. To preach a whole message on every one of these types here. The water being brought forth, Christ the water of life. The rock, he's the rock <laughs> And uh, he's the one that causes us to, possession the, to, to possess the promised land, to enter in. And I'm thankful to be able to tell you that everyone that God has purposed to save, guess what? He does. He has saved, he does save, and he shall save. Such is the salvation that is of God. We're going to draw a line there and uh, pick up with the rest of that next time. It's a long chapter. Lord dealing with this people in a mighty way, reminding them of who he is.